We have traveled to a subtropical forest in central Florida with a team of biologists. And today, we are in pursuit of an unusual pairing of organisms that may as well come straight out of a sci-fi nightmare. A fungal parasite that infects a host and proceeds to manipulate its behavior before killing it and using its body as a platform for its own reproduction and spread. These unlucky infected individuals are commonly and eerily referred to as zombie ants. Found one? Yeah. Okay. It's a little high. Okay. Let's see if we can find one down lower. Oh yeah, here it is. There's two. There's three right here. Alright, so we found one. My name's Ian and I'm a PhD student in the Charissa de Becker lab where we study uh, a fungal parasite. And when I'm talking about a fungal parasite, you can imagine something a little bit almost like a bread mold or a mushroom, but infects another animal. And so in our case, our fungus uh, will get into ants. This behavior changing manipulation is an impressive and diabolical evolutionary adaptation, which helps the fungus pass on its genetic material to future generations. Once infected, the fungus mysteriously takes control of an unfortunate ant's body and coerces it to climb up a nearby plant where the fungus will then compel the ant to bite down on the stem where it will be anchored for the remainder of its very short life. Most animals get infected by fungi, including humans, but we often associate a fungal infection with minor symptoms like an itchy skin rash. In this case, however, the manifestation is much more extreme as the infection progresses, the fungi send hyphae throughout the ant's entire body, including their muscles. Picture invasion of the body snatchers. Here already. You're next. The ant's body has effectively been snatched. At sort of the terminal phases of this sickness, they'll stumble their way up, a very uncoordinated kind of you know, sick and almost drunk looking. The fungus just manipulates them to climb up vegetation to an elevated height. And that's when the fungus coerces the ant to bite down on the forest vegetation with its mandibles, and then from there kills the ant and sprouts to the back of the ant's head. The infected ant, in its death grip, clutches with all its strength to elevated vegetation, becoming nothing more than a weaponized tool for spore dispersal. The fungus then grows a fruiting body, which bursts out of the back of the ant's head, extending outward, eventually launching out spores that rain down on the ants below, infecting more individuals. If we were at this stage where we have an ant that's uh, biting up on a plant mm -hmm. and the fungus has grown a stalk out of the back of its head and produces a, a fruiting body, from that fruiting body it can release spores, which will go out and either land directly on an ant or on the ground while they'll um, create a secondary spore that's kind of sticky and will hit an ant as it walks by. These ants, whether they're foraging or walking around on the forest floor, presumably, will come into contact with the um, fungal spores and those will be attached to them uh, and eventually they will penetrate the uh, cuticle or the exoskeleton of the outer shell of the ant and that's where it will develop and grow internally. Um, and it will start the, the first process of the infection. This highly specialized adaptation maximizes the fungi's ability to infect new ant hosts and continue the spread of the fungus through future generations. Researchers believe this ant manipulation behavior evolved in Ophiocordyceps more than 48 million years ago. Even if these ants were never turned into fungus-induced zombies, they would still be a complex and compelling species. This is Campanotus floridanus, the Florida carpenter ant. What can you tell me about their colony? So these are social insects that live in a group. That's what fascinates me the most is the social organization. So these are 
monogynous colonies. That means they have one queen and rest all of them are female workers, right? Okay. And, but we also have different castes in social insects. Like in bees, we have a worker caste, which are the non-reproductive ants in the colony and mm -hmm. then the reproductive queen. And within the workers, we have now behavioral caste is the ones who are adults, which are outside are foragers but the younger ones stay inside and work as nurses, tending the brood, tending to the queen, cleaning up the nest. But interestingly, in our system, we have another caste, which is the morphological caste. And these are the majors, which look bigger, yeah, huge heads, and they are the soldiers of the colony. And then you have the smaller ones, which are the miners, which does foraging and nursing. Okay, so you have these big colonies of a bunch of individual ants, but they're not the same. They have different castes. Um, that have different behaviors and different looks for different jobs, basically. That right? is it. Do they eat wood or they just nest they, in wood? So, unlike what the name suggests, they do not eat wood. They just nest inside the wood. They will usually chew out the wood and then deposit it outside the nest. Eat they hang wood. around wood, they don't eat it. They do not. I mean, I guess that's like a carpenter. A carpenter doesn't eat wood. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that's a they point. just work with it. <laughs> to study the zombie ant interaction in detail, it's very helpful for the researchers to have access to the carpenter ant colonies in the lab. Can you tell us quickly how it is that you're able to keep the ants in the lab so you can study them? Yeah, so once we dig these ants out from the field, we bring them back in. The researchers collect a queen and worker ants from the field and bring them into a temperature-controlled environment that mimics the structure of a rotting log with small connecting tunnels throughout. And are these ones that will just live there um, for a short while until they die, or are you able to have a colony that uh, persists? So to have a colony that persists, we have to have the queen. So we have a few colonies in the lab which have the queen, and she would lay egg every day, and the workers would take care of it, and the colony should be fine for like even two, three years. To study the fungal ant manipulation, researchers have developed techniques to harvest and maintain the fungus in a laboratory setting. Yeah, so first we go out into the field and we like to collect a sample of an infected ant. So ideally what From the infected ant, they extract living fungus cells and place them into a media where they can flourish. So these are all the blastospores, or we call them baby fungus. And from here we can use it later on to inject the ants with. Maintaining both ant and fungus populations in a controlled environment and with reliable methods for inducing the fungal infection in ants, the researchers are now allowed vast opportunities for detailed studies, experimentation, and discovery. The last thing you learned about was infecting these ants in the lab. Can you tell us about um, what it is you're studying once you have these infected ants? Right, so after infection, we can finally uh, test the behavior within a controlled lab environment. Um, so my project, I would like to uh, test the ants within a maze. Um, in this study, the researcher puts both infected and healthy ants into a 3D printed maze and observes how they differ in their navigation to the food at the end. The goal is to quantify what specific changes to the ant's behavior are taking place. Other studies in the lab, using genetics, aim to discover the mechanisms that allow the fungi to control the ant's behavior. While there's still so much to learn about Ophiocordyceps and how they make this complex takeover happen, they're not the only organisms to influence their host's behavior. It's much more common than you might think. And it doesn't just occur with ants. For example, experts believe that roughly one-third of the entire human population is currently infected with a brain parasite capable of altering its host's behavior. That host could be you. Even changes in our microbiome are believed to impact human behavior. Parasites selfishly influencing animal behavior are widespread and often very specialized. So Ian, are there other fungi that manipulate the behavior of their hosts? Yeah, so there's a number of different fungal parasites out there that can affect uh, various insects like beetles or flies or caterpillars. Um, but the one that we work on, uh, Ophiocordyceps, largely specializes on ants. And our local species, Ophiocordyceps campanodi floridani, um, is presumed to be specific to the Florida uh, carpenter ant. So is the type of manipulation we see in the Florida carpenter ant what you see in other systems? 
Um, so there are some variations, but also some common themes. And one of the things that you see in different insects with different fungi is something we call a summit disease, where the infected individual will be uh, manipulated to go to the top of a plant in an exposed area and die there. <laughs> Didn't you tell us one about the, earlier that it like burrows into the ground and oh, so actually that's, that's just a, a totally different. No, that is a summit disease because it's low in the ground and then at death it comes up shallow in the ground. So the caterpillar like naturally burrows. Okay. And it burrows deep, but before if it has the infection before it dies, it comes up within the first few centimeters of the soil oh, and okay. dies there. So then the the stalk that grows out can actually protrude out of the ground. Okay, so it still is climbing up, but it's, it's doing it underground. Exactly. Very cool. Yeah. A behavior controlling hostile body takeover from a parasitic fungi might feel more like the product of an eccentric horror story than a backyard commonplace, but evolution can follow unexpected routes. And these living nightmares are out there among us, and they're not uncommon, mostly unnoticed, and still scarcely understood. So we've been out all day learning about uh, zombie ants and these carpenter ants. Are these something that we can find around here all the time? In fact, we do. This is, I believe, one of the most common backyard ants you can find. If there's a piece of log that's being left behind in your backyard for like a few months, chances are you will find carpenter ants out there. We are in a parking lot today, and this is one of my favorite spots on campus, because there's a nest that has a uh, that nest right inside the floor of the parking garage and it just is amazing how they can actually find small spots where they can nest in. So I'm curious, uh, do we know if in these types of uh, habitats we see the infections and the zombie ant behavior happening? I do not know. It's, it's amazing how little we know about the system. Even though we study it in labs, we really don't know much about the natural history. Thanks for joining us today through the terrifying world of zombie ants. Special thanks to Charissa DeBecker and the DeBecker Lab for taking us out into the field and into their lab to show us the research they're working on and their process. We'll see you next time.